Jasvina Vadita Mastu Mavidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om, peace, peace, peace and beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Well, good morning, dear ones, and welcome to our Sunday morning discussion of Karma Yoga. Uh, and may this holy day season uh, bring blessings and joy to you and your home. So, uh, there are a couple of announcements. Save us Saturday for this month is Saturday, December 10th. Please note that on your calendar. We start at 10 a.m. and go to 2 p.m. Lunch is provided for those who are here at lunchtime. Uh, you, of course, do not have to uh, be here at all for all of that time. Come as you are, come as you can and help your center decorate and spruce up for the holy day season. Serve as you are able and as is practical for you. Um, this coming Saturday, uh, the 10th, uh, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, in all probability, most of the work will be indoors in the chapel and in the monastery. I'm pleased to say we will have three in-person gatherings during the next weeks. These will all be in the chapel. Uh, first will be Holy Mother's Birthday celebration on December the 18th. Uh, we have yet to know who's going to be our Pujari, but uh, you watch your e-news for all these details. Our Christmas Eve meditation will be on December the 24th. Our, our Christmas Eve worship, I mean, our Christmas Eve worship will be on December the 24th. And our observance of Kalpataru Day will fall on January 1st, as it does each year. As I said, watch your e-news, your e-newsletter, and our website for details, and for a list of our precautions for coming and participating in uh, those events in person here in the chapel and in the monastery. Uh, for those of you who are thinking about that, are there any announcements that I might have made that I did not make? Shankara? Yes, dear. Could you, could you mention the precautions just for folks? Uh, yes, everyone must be fully va vaccinated and you must wear a mask, uh, except when you are taking prasad uh, all uh, during the entire time you're here, everyone will be masked. Uh, you simply cannot uh, attend without the, the mask and without being fully vaccinated. Thank you, Lori. Anything else from anyone? All right. December is a month 
for the study of karma yoga, a spiritual path leading to the abandonment of selfishness. As a karma yogi, you practice offering your actions and their results, as well as your perceptions, thoughts, and feelings to the divine presence. Even before fully knowing this presence, you hold firmly to the belief that the presence is within each person or other living being that you interact with or serve. Working and abiding in this spirit, you are increasingly able to release attachment to your activities. I'll start that again. It means that you must actually do this, not just think about it. Working and abiding in this spirit, you are increasingly able to release attachment to your activities and their results. This is the freedom and contentment promised by Sri Krishna, Krishna as uh, the results of karma yoga. And he says in chapter 2 of Bhagavad Gita, even a little practice of this yoga will save you from the terrible wheel of rebirth and death. <clears throat> So that's what we're going to, that's the frame of reference for in which we're going to uh, discuss, present and discuss this morning. As always, this is not meant for you as personal instruction. This is not meant as something you should do or must do or a way that you must think. There is no dogma associated with this. This is simply a presentation of certain uh, information uh, in the context of karma yoga for your use if it is useful to you. Take what you will, leave aside what you do not to find useful to you or practical, and, uh, and please do not feel as if you're being told what to do. With that, you probably practice, each of you in one way or another, probably practice some form of prayer, contemplation, concentration, or meditation. As this practice has matured, quite naturally, you learn how to watch your thoughts. It's just a natural thing that happens as we practice any of those things. We see our thoughts coming in to interrupt whatever it is we're practicing. <clears throat> when that happened, when you learned to watch your thoughts, you may have realized that without giving it much attention, you affirm again and again a particular version of reality. These affirmations are rehearsals of the play you believe in and your roles in that play. We each write our own play, so to speak, and we affirm it over and over. And of course, we have a number of roles. Now within uh, Sanatana Dharma, the play we believe in is called Maya, our interaction with Maya. And these roles we uh, believe that we are playing are called upadis or limitations. Yet great spiritual teachers tell us that the play itself and these characters you seem to be are nothing more than fabrications of the mind. The mind is the source of all that we see and experience. They are nothing more than fabrications of your mind. For example, 
Sage Vashishta told Lord Rama, the mind stuff in Sanskrit, Chitta, the mind stuff is the cause of the experience of all material objects. As long as there is Chitta, the three worlds, waking, dreaming, and dreamless sleep, also appear in one's perceptions as real. <clears throat> this is a quote from Nectar of the book Nectar of Supreme Knowledge, uh, chapter 4, verse 9, or Shloka 9. So I'm going to repeat what Vashishta said. He, Lord Rama was receiving three days of instruction. This is one of the instructions. The mind stuff, chitta, is the cause of the existence of all material objects. As long as there is chitta, the three worlds, the three worlds that in which we abide, waking, dreaming, and dreamless sleep, also appear in one's perception and we see them as real. That's what Vashishta said. But as Swami Vivekananda insisted, what you perceive now is caused by your past and present thoughts and actions. This can be changed by new actions and thoughts. What you perceive now is caused by your past and present thoughts and actions. This can be changed by new thoughts and actions. You can quite deliberately, quite deliberately rewrite your play. This morning we will explore and discuss these ideas and how they integrate with Sri Krishna's Karma Yoga. <clears throat> any comment from anyone or any thoughts or concerns or questions that any of this has raised so far? Shankara? Yes, dear. Um, can you talk a little bit about dreamless sleep? Dreamless sleep is our latent subconscious or uh, as is, is commonly called the unconscious. Don't believe that nothing is going on there. Uh, if you look at the research on the brain, you'll find that there is there are brain waves occurring during dreamless sleep. We're simply not aware of it. Our waking awareness, or even our dream sleep awareness, is not present there. We are in a state of meditation, but we're not aware of it. And so what happens is uh, you are uh, experiencing that uh, bliss that it comes with uh, manifesting our own true original nature, the, uh, the Atman. Uh, this is what's happening during dreamless sleep. And it's why we wake up feeling refreshed. Oh, I had a good night's sleep. That means you had good dreamless sleep in which you were in, in the presence of the Ananda Maya Kosha, the bliss body or the causal body that is the root and source of the energy of our manifestation. That's what's going on during dreamless sleep according to uh, both the Sanatana Dharma, according to the monks of uh, the Tibetan uh, group that is associated with the Dalai Lama that are working over at uh, Emory University uh, in the Dalai Lama's Institute. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, by other brain researchers who look at these, this brainwave phenomena going on in dreamless sleep. Anything else, uh, Lori, or anything else from anyone? Brother, can you? Yes, dear. Okay, can I, am I heard? Yes. 
what you said is a complete truth, which is easy to accept at superficial level. But when it comes to deep down, we want to stay away from it because we are completely wrapped up in Maya. So <laughs> not yes. trying to see the full truth of what you say. And therefore, I want to exemplify it in two ways. Number one was the Valmiki. Valmiki, <clears throat> he was a rishi, when, before be, be, becoming a rishi, he was a professional robber. He used to rob the people passing through the forest. And one time the robbers came to him and says, I, everything that you have, you give to me. He says, oh, I will gladly give, but ask your wife that the sin you commit by robbing me, is she prepared to share with you? He says, of course, that's why I'm working. I'm working for her bread and butter. No, okay, go and ask. So his wife says, no, the sin is yours to keep. <laughs> and then he realized what you just said, that they are called relative, they are not absolute. Yes. Number two example, which is more practical, was our uh, Vedantist, Miki. May, very, very, very few people, if at all, will remember him, but he came from St. Louis uh, quite a few years back. Huge man, huge man, and thorough devotee of Vedanta. So we used to accept him like our Vedantist for the one time in our common celebration, he whispered in my ears, man, I'm dying and I would like you to help me die. I said, what are you talking about? He says, I've got a bad brain tumor and I'm going to die. But I want to die very peacefully and while thinking of Vedanta and spirituality of life to help me. So that's how we met many times when he was hospitalized. And whenever I met him, he would never ask me about how are you or nothing. What was the last topic last Sunday that we discussed in Vedan? His only question to me. Not only that, but there was an experimental drug going on that time at Emory. And they asked him that this is an experimental drug for your brain tumor. Would you submit to it? He says, my brain, my body is going to perish anyway. So use it in any way you can. And therefore, he went to that experimental drug therapy. This is what is called the true denunciation of the body. Yes. Which is possible even for human beings. And that's why I wanted to share with you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Much. Uh, this uh, exemplifies uh, a man who had changed, as we will see, he had changed his, his thoughts, therefore his speech and his actions, to match his spiritual intentions. And this is, of course, what we're discussing this morning. This is karma yoga. How do you do this? How do you do this? So thank you, Dr. Much. What you are experiencing as you sit at home this morning is indeed the highest reality seen through the veil of time, space, and causation. Time, space, and causation, the components of Maya. Sage Vashishta says, your mind stuff, chitta, is the instrument by which Maya manifests what you perceive as real. <clears throat> Swami Vivekananda calls this a lesser reality. It's not an unreality or an untruth. It is simply a lesser reality, which is his way of saying the same thing that Adi Shankaracharya said, this is a relative or superimposed reality. But it is the reality that we know until we know the reality beyond it. What can you know about this reality? Do you really have any say at all 
about your experience of it. So these are the two questions we'll address. What can you know about this reality? Do you have any say at all about your experience of it? Here's a dramatic answer to these questions. Jill Bolte Taylor, a Harvard University neuroanatomist, had a massive brain hemorrhage. That stroke took her left mind, her left hemisphere, that stroke took her left hemisphere mind functions completely offline. They were not available to her at all. As a result, she discovered a right hemisphere personality of which she had been completely unaware. As Taylor worked for years to regain her left brain functions, she learned nothing, this is a quote from her, nothing external to me has the power to take away my peace of heart and mind. That is completely up to me. Nothing external to me has the power to take away my peace of mind. That is completely up to me. My peace of heart and mind. I may not be in total control of what happens to my life, but I certainly am in charge of how I choose to perceive my experience. <clears throat> One of the greatest lessons I learned was how to feel the physical component of emotion. Joy was a feeling. This was the experience of her right hemisphere personality. I learned to feel the physical component of emotion. Joy was a feeling in my body. Peace was a feeling in my body. I thought it was interesting that I could feel when a new emotion was triggered, I could feel new emotions flood through, through, through me and then release me. They came, they arose, and they passed away. This is my interpretation. I could feel new emotions flood through me and then release me. I had to learn new ways to label these feeling experiences. And most remarkably, I learned that I had the power to choose whether to hook onto a feeling and prolong its presence in my body. I learned that I had the power to choose whether to hook into a feeling and prolong its presence in my body or just let it quickly flow right out of me. I made my decisions based upon how these things felt inside. I made my decisions based upon how things felt inside. There were certain emotions like anger, frustration, or fear that felt uncomfortable when they surged through my body. So I told my brain that I didn't like that feeling and didn't want to hook into these neural loops. This is what she, the term that she came up with for what we would call some scars. These things that get triggered in us, we're told by the gunas, by these external circumstances over which we do not have control, the gunas and our karma <clears throat> trigger these feelings, thoughts, perceptions. She calls them neural loops. She learned that she had the power to decide whether or not I learned that I could use my left mind 
through language to talk directly to my brain and tell it what I wanted and what I didn't want. This, upon, from this realization, I knew I would never return to the personality I had been before. <clears throat> I spent eight years watching my mind analyze. I spent eight years, that's how long it took her to recover herself from that hemorrhage. I spent eight years watching my mind analyze everything that was going on in my brain. Each day brought new challenges and insights. The more I recovered my old files, the more my old emotional baggage surfaced, and the more I needed and the more I needed to evaluate the usefulness of perceiving this underlying neural content, chemistry, circuitry. But realistically, I know that no one has the power to make me feel anything except for me and my brain. Nothing external to me has the power to take away my peace of heart and mind. <clears throat> this has been mentioned many times before. This is from Jill Bolte Taylor's book, My Stroke of Insight. My Stroke of Insight. I highly recommend it as reading for any spiritual aspect. And here's a comment, not made intentionally, but certainly very germane, very applicable to what we've just read. This is from Cindy Craven's song, Love Shining Peace. There's a wonder in the way we're always free to change the world by changing how we see. There's a wonder in the way we're always free to change the world by changing how we see. So before we go on to another example, any comments from your own wisdom or experience, any comment from your own wisdom or, ex or experience, or any concern or question that this raises for you, Jill Bolte Taylor's experience and the fact that she learned that nothing external to her had the power to control her peace of heart and mind. That she could be peaceful, loving, compassionate. Uh, Brother Gaurav here. Yes, Gaurav. Um, it almost... Uh... I, I don't know if, if, if I think this is what I what I'm trying to practice myself is when you're in a stressful situation, because the stress is sort of associated with the Maya and your environment at that point of time. It's good to detach it's it's good to kind of detach yourself from it and try to get a bird's eye view of your situation from the top. And then things seem to be so much simpler means why am I doing this <laughs> you start questioning I don't have to this is my body which is doing it but I can just walk away from the situation it, well that, that bird's eye view is the view of your heart-centered being and its relationship to the Atman the Saguna Atman it, and it is called by Sri Krishna and, and, and other scriptures, it's called the witness. And when you take that bird's eye view exactly, you see there's nothing compelling me to feel this way, to think this way, to do this way. I All of this is just my history. It is the play I've learned 
to uh, enact and the roles I've learned to enact within that play. And there's no reason I have to continue that. I can rewrite the play, which is what Jill Bolte Taylor did in the most emphatic terms. She rewrote her play. It doesn't, she didn't change the play. She continued to be, after she recovered herself, she continued to be a Harvard uh, neuroanatomist and has gone on to uh, even greater uh, uh, achievements than she could have possibly imagined uh, in her previous personality. And if you ask Jill Bolte Taylor, I've seen interviews in which she asked, who are you? And she says, I am a being as big as the universe. <laughs> That's her answer. So thank you, Gora. You're right. You do not have to. Nothing and external I, to you. And almost this is my personal experience. The more you try to, uh, like, I don't know, reach out to mother or, or <laughs> father, divine, it, it helps try to get you to that point. Yes, indeed. That, of course, that's a bhaktas statement. That's a, that's a devotional statement. And it's contained within karma yoga. That is to say, uh, Sri Krishna says, uh, offer everything to the divine presence, however it is you conceptualize. It. But yes, indeed, that is one of the ways to do this. It is giving name and form to the power that exists within us. Call it mother or father or Krishna or Jesus or whatever it is. The, that power is not external to you as Vivekananda insists over and over. The power is within you. But when we, because we need to do this, as Jill Bolte Taylor says, you talk to your mind, your mind talks to your body. Hmm? You, uh, you, you give things name and form. So thank you. Anything else from anyone? Good morning, Brother Shankar. Go ahead. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, I wasn't sure. Um, <clears throat> I just had a live experience last Monday about what you're talking about. Um, since July 6th, I have had the indescribable blessing of being a foster father to an 11 year old child oh my goodness and it is by far the greatest experience that <clears throat> i have had so to, to date and last monday uh he had soccer practice and they let him on the team even though uh he can't play in the games he's smaller than the other kids he's not really a good soccer player but they let him go to the practice which i appreciate and I watch him practice and I was sitting there realizing that I was sitting there in judgment. <sighs> do this. Don't do that. Go, go be more assertive. Don't do that. Don't do it. And I, re I recognize like she was saying in the body, agitation, tensity, agitation, irritability. And all of a sudden I heard that one question by Byron Katie who would you be right now without your story? <laughs> yes. And all of a sudden, my body relaxed, <laughs> this thing shifted, and I said, I would be a man enjoying the experience of parenthood. Yes. And all of a sudden, I saw this child perfect. You know, he's out there, he's involved, he's trying his best, he's having a good time. He doesn't have this, my story, and I don't want to give it to him. <laughs> you know, he was just there trying. He was courageous. He is more courageous than I was at that age. He didn't run away saying, I'm smaller than the rest of them. I'm not good enough. So without my story, all of a sudden, I saw a magnificent being. And that lasted for about two minutes until my story started creeping in again. And I had to be mindful once again. But I just experienced what you're talking about. And it's phenomenal. Yes, 
thank you, Frank, as always, for your for sharing so authentically and so truthfully yourself uh, and who you are. That is exactly it. In that moment, you rewrote the play. I can be, I can see the gold in this moment, in this child. This the wonder of that moment. And as you say, the old story will try to reassert itself. Oh my God, is it powerful. But we can, we can, with work and work and work and practice and practice and practice, we can rewrite that play to where we are no longer the person that we were when uh, we began the process of spiritual practice. Thank you, Frank, as always. Anything else from anyone? Brother Shankara, this is Haima. Yes, Haima. I have to tell you, in the past, I used to rehearse my past adversities, exploitations by people, and then wondered, <clears throat> how did I let this happen all the time? How did I let this happen? And then it didn't bring me happiness. Then I started changing my story. I took the power within me, like Jill Bodhi said, and I started rehearsing differently, like choosing uh, because of these obstacles that happened to me. Look, I am purified by these. Yeah. These obstacles purified me and moved me to higher realm of the spiritual path. Look where I am now. That's all the past. Of course, these things happen to many people, not just me alone. I started, when I started changing the story, those things don't bother anymore. We all have past that some of us have, not all, some of us have the past that can be very haunting if you let them. Then I realized, hey, because of this, 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 here I am, liberated woman totally liberated. I'm not attached to that anymore. I'm able to talk about it at the same time, regulate my emotions in a calmer way. So that moved me such a peace and contentment in life. That's that, that it is a self positive self talk by recognizing, yes, it happened, but this, this, this happened. And that's why I'm here today to yes. do better. I'm here today to do better move forward better to mm -hmm. higher realm of spiritual path. Exactly. That's All of our past brought us to what we are today. Celebrate that fact Eggs. and then say, but I don't have to, as Jill Bolte Taylor said, I have the choice about whether letting those, those things from the past that my body does not like the feeling mm -hmm. of, Mm -mm. I can say no to those and simply say, no, I choose peace of heart, peace of mind. I do not have to let those things possess me. I can rewrite my play as you, as you said you did. Beautiful. Thank you. And then we can brood on it forever if we don't move towards the higher realm. Otherwise, we'll be rehearsing the same old dramas well, in our minds and then keep brooding on it and giving babies to it and do all sorts of stuff. This, but is, that's what, not this is what so many people do, Heim. We self, all, I think we're all self, guilty of it. Yes. They self-medicate in some way yes. to dull the pain, but they continue, as you say, to brood and, and practice that same old drama. They rehearse it and they enact it. Yeah, the rehearsing the past is like an addiction. It yes. just takes over you if we let it. If yes. we stop it there, okay, because of these, these, these things, look at me, my heart is purified by these people. And Excellent. I thank them, I thank them actually, those past people who had, done, who had done wrong to me. It's okay. Because of these people, I woke up. I woke up and I realized I have better self. Thank I am you. stronger than those. Thank I am, you. I, thank you, Haima. Thank That's you, exactly Gosh. what Holy Mother said. When you come to see clearly, you will see that all suffering is a blessing. 
because, as you said, it purifies you. And it's not easy to see it. It's not easy to live that. So anything else from anyone? Hey, this is Tom. Can you hear me? Certainly can, Tom. So uh, this has been a great discussion. First, some Frank, what Frank said brought up some memories. When I was much younger, uh, one summer I was a swim team coach. And the kids were wonderful. I loved the kids. The parents were difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I noticed lately I, I, there's a just a, a park where I walk, and there's all these signs around the soccer field aimed at the parents that say it's just a game. Uh, no scholarships will be given out today. Uh, you know, the coaches and, and referees are probably volunteers. But uh, anyhow, that I've never been a parent and I've been, never been a parent watching my kid in a sporting event, but uh, I remember that. Now it seems kind of funny. Uh, thinking about what we've been saying, uh, the Jill Bolte Taylor stuff is wonderful. And when I hear that, I mean, that just about describes perfectly my experience in my clearer moments. That's the way, that's true. That's the way it is. The thing, the thing that keeps coming up for me when I hear stuff like that is she, she uses words like complete control. And uh, that's what I experience in my clearer moments, but I'm not always in those clearer moments, you know? Uh, and then I wonder, is it even worth mentioning that? Does everybody know that? Does every, everybody already knows that, that you don't experience that all the time, you experience it some of the time. But I keep mentioning it because it seems like I beat up on myself so much over the years because my mind would wander in meditation. You know, I would think about other things. I didn't have complete control. I couldn't be in this state all the time. And uh, I've been working with a meditation instructor recently who just really emphasizes that, you know, that the brain is an organ that, that creates thoughts and it's there and you will, you will have thoughts. You will get lost in thoughts. Sometimes your mind will wonder. That's part of the process. Just pay attention to that. Like all the rest of the process, that's really helpful for me to be reminded of. So, so, but anyway, in a, in a group discussion, I wonder, am I just being a spoiled sport by coming in here and saying that's true some of the time, but not all the time? Or no, I... no, Tom, but because the subtext of what you just okay. said is that your teacher is saying you do have complete control. You do have the ability to say yes or no to those thoughts and, or simply to say, I'm just going to watch them arise and pass away. And this is what Jill Bolte Taylor says about these feelings that surge through her these feelings of anger, frustration. It isn't that they don't occur, all of these thoughts, and but she simply says, I don't have to let them control me. I have control over them. And so we'll, and we're going to talk more explicitly about meditation in this next example. There's, there's a second example uh, in, in this morning's discussion of someone who learned to practice meditation uh, very deliberately, learned to practice meditation. And what he learned and how he manifested, how he rewrote his drama, his play. And he came from a very unpleasant and dramatic beginning in his life. So thank you, Tom. And I don't think there's any contradiction at all between what you're saying and what your teacher is, is saying uh, and what Joe Bolte Taylor said. I, I don't think there's any contradiction. The one thing I would say is that I experienced like this forgetting, you know, like this is what everything she's saying and everything you're saying is the truth, but I'll forget. I, in meditation, I'll forget, you know, I'll, I'll, be sitting and I'll realize that for the last several minutes I've been thinking about my income taxes and I completely forgot that I was meditating 
or I'll be in some stressful situation and I will <clears throat> respond with the negative emotions and for, for completely forget the wisdom of what you're saying and what she's saying. I'm just saying, saying that I'm not always there and I experience forgetting. Well, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> Yeah. And and that is part of that is what Maya, this is the description of Maya. Maya is it, it exists, it seems, and in some scriptures it's said quite deliberately to make us forget, to <laughs> cause us to forget, to cause us to be distracted. And so we say no to it when we discover, oh, that's what I've been doing we say no to it. And then we return to that which makes us feel more uh, integrated and peaceful. Yeah, Thank that's, you, Tom, that's, my, that's my experience that yes. there's, there's a forgetting, but then there's a waking up. Yes, like what you describe saying no to it like, oh, you know, I'm I was supposed to be meditating or oh, I was supposed to be a kind and pleasant person and I'm getting irritated, you know, wake up. <laughs> Yes, all exactly. And wake up all sleep again. That's that's my experience. Well, there we are. And it's as Laurie asked in the very beginning, what about this dreamless sleep? That's the only place where we experience uninterruptedly this bliss of not forgetting. But we're not aware of it. We're not aware that that's what's happening during those moments. Our our waking, our our ability to see what's going on is not present, but it is going on nevertheless. So this is what happens when we go into deep meditation also, is we lose our outer awareness and we're in that same, but the only difference is there is still an awareness of what's, there's still an awareness that I am in this silent blissful state. Anything else from anyone before we go on? Yes, sir. Swamiji? Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Saraswati, and this is my first ever meeting or Zoom with the uh, Vedanta group. Well, thank you for coming, Saraswati. Uh, thank well, you. Um, and I, you know, I was really, I've been listening to uh, Swami Sarva Priyananda's talks on uh, YouTube, just very, very, very nice, uplifting. Uh, my my question is this: um, I've been on spiritual path since a young woman in my middle twenties, mm -hmm. and uh, so I've given over half of my adult life to spiritual practice, um, meditation, um, uh, following uh, the path of the guru. However, um, uh, after 45 years or so of sadhana, um, I don't even know how to put this in a context in such a sacred space as this, but um, it, I have realized that uh, my guru has not lived the dharma of what he has taught. Um, just, when things happen like this, I just, I don't know what to do. I just feel so lost. Um, should I? Saraswati, I have, his, have his instructions to you produced something wonderful within you? I don't know, Swamiji, I can't say that they have. I, I, I follow them, but, uh, and I have a very easeful practice and I cannot deny that my meditation practice has benefited my life, but should I start over with a different teacher? No, what do no, I do no, with no. this? That's, no, dear. What, what it is, is, is this. There's a saying in Zen, though my teacher, spends every night at the grog shop. In other words, the bar, the tavern. Though my teacher spends every night at the grog shop, still he is my teacher. That is to say, he has imparted the truth to me. The truth that is, is imparted to me is mine to keep and use and 
for self-transformation. The fact that he is backsliding, the fact that he has fallen from the path. This is not to be wondered at. It's in all the scriptures that this happens to the even the great ones. Krishna mentions it in the Gita. Adi Shankaracharya mentions it in the last two chapters of uh, of uh, Viveka Chudamani. That the teacher, it is possible for our teacher, and of course it is heartbreaking. Of course it is because we invest so much in our devotion to the guru. But remember that what you are worshiping when you worship the guru is the truth that that guru stands on. But has he the truth? Is it the truth if he hasn't followed it himself? But dear, you may or may not continue to follow it yourself. We are capable, as St. Francis of Assisi said, of any act. We simply do not know what it is that we're capable of until the circumstances arise that uh, lead us in that direction. As St. Francis of Assisi said, true love and compassion cannot flow from your eyes and lips until you too admit that you are capable of any act. So it, if, you, if you live in judgment of your teacher, if you feel betrayed by your teacher, which are completely understandable uh, responses, you can say, all right, that's how I feel. And he has earned that by his actions. That is his karma. But did, as you say, did the what he give, gave me yield something good for me? I will hold to that. When we worship the feet of the guru, we are worshiping the, what he stands on or she stands on, not the personality. The personality is fallible, and of course it is heartbreaking, and it has happened to many, many uh, of us who follow this path. We have seen our teacher fall from grace. Yes. And it is absolutely the, their parabdha karma, their, the karma that brought them into this world has its many aspects and some of them are not pleasant and some of them will cause them to yield to whatever it is that draws them away from the path. And there's no denying Saraswati Ji. There's no denying that it is heartbreaking and very hard to recover from. <clears throat> um, I wish I could suddenly uh, call the voice of Jerry Brunner, a dear friend and brother of the way, uh, who was a teacher for many years uh, of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogis. Uh, and when he saw the, the Maharishi fall from the way and become distracted by wealth and fame and power, he felt greatly betrayed, and it took him years to get over it. But now he treasures all those hours that he spent with the Maharishi, where he was told the truth and learned to practice the truth. And he simply is able to set aside his feelings of betrayal because his teacher fell from that grace. That's it was his perception. I know I don't know anything about the truth of, of the Maharishi myself personally. All I know is what Jerry, who was a teacher for him for years, has told me. But I wish I could call Jerry to speak right now, because he certainly would understand and empathize with what you're saying. So thank you for sharing yourself with us, Saraswati. Thank you for being vulnerable enough and courageous enough to do that.
Thank you so much. And, and be of good cheer, dear. You have been given the truth. It resulted in a spiritual practice that has manifested itself for years. It will continue if you continue to follow the instructions and simply try to see your teacher as the fallible human being that he is as well as the spiritual master that knew these truths and passed them to you. Thank you. Namaste. May you be well and in bright spirits, dear. Namaste. Thank you so much. Anything? Yes, dear. Something I'd like to say to the lady who just spoke. Um, I often say jokingly, take my advice, I'm not using it. And, <laughs> you know, if somebody tells you not to smoke, that it's bad for your health, that information is valid, even if they smoke and they're dying from lung cancer. You know, just because they're not able to practice it doesn't invalidate the information. Oh. So if somebody gives me good information, I take it. If somebody says, hey, your boat doesn't look good, I fix my boat instead of yelling, well, look at your boat. You're sinking. It doesn't matter. The information <laughs> is good. So, yeah, just maybe that's something for, for your heart. Well, Frank. I, I love I, you, Frank. <laughs> yes, we love you, Frank. Advice. That, I love that. Take my advice. I'm, I'm going to barge in too a little bit and and uh, Brother Shankara gives, you know, everybody gives their answer from where they are. And he is steeped in this tradition and the, the order and, and that I hear that in his answer. And there's nothing, I'm not being contrary to his answer, but um, I don't, Saraswati, I don't know the details of what it is, you know, how, if it's little things that your teacher has not followed um, that he teaches or she teaches or bigger things, um, but, or what tradition it is, but in a tradition that considers a guru God, I think we do, we can't just say, oh, I'm just going to forgive it and go on. And um, <clears throat> this is, again, just my opinion and we're from where I stand. But one of my teachers that is used to say, kind of like what Frank said, which is, you know, take what you like and let the wind blow the rest away, it, which is partly what Brother Shankar was saying about, you know, take the parts of the teaching, take the teaching. If the teaching's working for you, keep it. But if you can't continue to follow somebody, I'm going to step up and say, there's no, life's too short and there's no reason to torture yourself. There are lots of, of sanghas and teachers teaching the same sorts of things who aren't going to torture you with their transgressions. So that's just my, and I wish you the very, very best in your journey. So much. This is what it means to study the art of spirituality together. Listen to this discussion, everyone. Isn't this grand? Uh, this is just exactly what we're here for. And when and the thing that we we can understand is that when we judge, when we sit in judgment, it is simply a way of boxing something up so that we don't have to deal with it. So when we, if you can just set aside the judgment and say, what are my feelings? What is it that is really happening to me? And then deal with that as, as authentically and as realistically as you can. <clears throat> and uh, Cindy said something that I'm just going to take a little exception to. Uh, it isn't that within this tradition, 
the guru is seen as God. The guru is seen as a personality who has taken on the face of God by practicing self-surrender. But that doesn't mean the personality has gone away. The personality is there as long as the body is there. And so one would hope that no one worships the guru as God. That's what I meant when I said, it is not the person that we are worshiping when we worship the guru's feet. It is the, it is the wisdom and the, their, the truth that they stand on. So wonderfully, 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 this discussion has gone on. Anything else from anyone? I'll say something. Uh, there's already been such great stuff from Shankara and Frank and Cindy about uh, the disappointment that comes from a, sp a bad or a spiritual teacher that goes wrong or whatever. I had that experience when I was younger. It was very painful. In addition to everything that, that you've talked about, there was the, the feeling of losing the community because there was a whole community of people around this teacher. Right. It, and, you know, that was my, my tribe, you know, my people, my, my, my community. And once I said what was true to me, what was obvious, uh, I was shunned. Uh, those people weren't my, didn't want to be my friends anymore, didn't want to talk about it. So I don't have any solution to that. I just had to go out and meet new people and find new communities and so on. But that's an additional difficulty. Of Truly it is, it yeah. is. And then the, the community, it's almost like, you know, the big lie that we hear about in politics. It's, it's just like the big lie is still being perpetu perpetuated in this uh, sangam. And it's just very hurtful. Um, I, it's, I just, I, I haven't processed it fully, but I really do thank Swamiji for his uh, perspective that I can reflect upon and contemplate as I process this whole situation. And, but, and, and Saraswati know that you are welcome among us. Uh, I know nothing can replace, I'm not saying that we are a replacement but just know that you are welcome and loved among us, as you have heard from others who've spoken to you uh, directly. Thank you. I am very grateful. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes. And we all wish you well, dear, so very well. And may these holy days uh, that uh, have such power, uh, may your reflection and your experience of these holy days uh, for the rest of the, this year uh, and into the spring uh, be healing for you. Thank you. <clears throat> now it's a little afternoon. There is a second example, the example of James Doty, and, uh, that is uh, really remarkable. For those of you who would like to have that uh, uh, example, it's in the talk notes uh, in its fullness, all everything, not what I might have said about it or what you might have said in response to it, but at least the story of James Doty. Uh, it, it is another really dramatic example of someone who successfully and dramatically reclaimed and redefined himself from a very, very inauspicious beginning. James Doty, MD, MD. And he has a book. I'll, I'll go to the end and read the name of the book. I think it's just called The Magic Shankar. Brother Shankar, uh, uh, could you spell his name, please? D-O-T-Y, James Doty. And the name of the book? I, I'm I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have to scroll down. Oh, it isn't here. Oh, it's called the Magic Shop. The Magic Shop. The name of the book is the Magic Shop. 
and Thank it tells you. this is where he learned and it's it's a it's a wonderful pun now i am going to read this from vivekananda uh, there is a little bit here that i am going to read at the end and then anyone who chooses to uh, join in the discussion about that will welcome that as as many of you as wish to stay swami vivekananda said <coughs> The finer is always the cause. <clears throat> the finer is always the cause, the grosser the effect. So the external world is the effect. The internal, the cause. There cannot be a cause without an effect. The present must have had its cause in the past and will have its effect in the future. So this is Swami Vivekananda saying, this is where we have the control. We can change the effect by changing the cause. There cannot be a cause without an effect. The present must have its cause in the past and will have its effect in the future. Now, Tom Carr mentioned a teacher that he's studying with. This is a quote from that teacher. He sent it, and I just thought it was priceless. Forget, this is, this is the start of the quote, forget about enlightenment. Sit down wherever you are, and listen to the wind singing in your veins. Feel the love, the longing, the fear in your bones. Open your heart to who you are right now, not who you would like to be. Open your heart to who you are right now, not who you would like to be, not the saint, you are striving to become, but the being right here before you, inside you, around you, all of you is holy. You are already more and less than whatever you can know. You are already more and less than whatever you can know. Breathe out, touch in, let go. This is from the teacher John Wellwood, and part of his instructions for meditation. This is, was sent in an email from Tom Carr this last week. <clears throat> Could you spell the last name, please? W E L. W O O D W E L one L W E L W O O D. And then I'm going to repeat what I read earlier, what I quoted earlier from Cindy Craven, which is this great insight that's in her song. There's a wonder in the way we're always free to change the world by changing how we see. There's a wonder in the way we're always free to change the world by changing how we see. That's the power that we have, the power to change how we see. When we, what we see, what we perceive changes, our thoughts change, our speech changes, our behavior changes, and this is the true measure of spiritual progress. That last was from me and from Swami Swahananda. So anything at all in response to what was just read and said? Sean, Brother, I... uh, oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. Lori. Uh, excuse me, would you mind just reading that, that quote again that, that Tom sent you? Yes, I'll read it again. Thank you. It, it's in the notes, by the way. So if you want to, if you want to, to get it in, it's uh, if you want to copy it out. 
But here's what uh, was said. Forget about enlightenment. Sit down wherever you are and listen to the wind singing in your veins. Feel the love, the longing, the fear in your bones. Open your heart to who you are right now, not who you would like to be, not the saint you are striving to become, but the being right here before you, inside you, around you. All of you is holy. You are already more and less than whatever you can know. Breathe out, touch in, let go. Thank Anything you. At all? And somebody else was going to speak when Lori started speaking. Yes, uh, Gaurav here, sir. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, I came across the poem uh, in Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, Song of Myself. Yes. Uh, it is exactly what we are talking about. Oh, exactly. Precisely. <laughs> truth, is so one, truth is one. Sages call it by many names. And Walt Whitman was acknowledged as a sage, as a, as a saint, by, uh, by Swami Vivekananda. He called him the American Sannyasin. And any of you who haven't read Walt Whitman's Song of Myself, all I can say is, please do find it. You can find it online. It is. It Don't is have stunning. To buy a book. Hmm? So there is It is stunning. It is. It is fantastic. I mean, it is. It is. I, I celebrate yourself. I think it. It literally is telling you at the end. I mean, yes. Is, yes. That is it. <laughs> Forget about everything else. Celebrate yourself. Well, this. If you read the book, love poems from God. Yes, I, I have that. Each of these 12 saints <laughs> says exactly the same thing. All of you is holy. Celebrate yourself. But it's because it's not talking about anything limited. When we, when we see clearly, we see our physical being is the manifestation of what's within. And therefore, when we purify what's within, that which is without becomes purer and purer. And finally, it is nothing but radiance, which is what the saints become. But it, it, if you strive for it, as Wellwood points out, you're missing the point. <laughs> if you the striving itself is an agitation of the mind that is a distraction. The self-criticism, the beating oneself up for not being something that you're not. And, and, and brother, I've noticed like, uh, the, like the, there are many spiritual, uh, I wouldn't say gurus, but people who think they're spiritual and they, they start judging other people saying, oh, they're not doing this. Not really means that's not your purpose. <laughs> Let them be themselves means. <clears throat> Swami Swahananda said something very, very, uh, very, very, I, it was inspiring and, and left a mark in, in this art. Uh, as part of the Interreligious Council of Southern California, he was asked at one time to go and look into what uh, Scientology did and taught because they had applied to become part of the Interreligious Council. And so the Swami did what he was asked and he was a very thorough and complete man he studied their books, he interviewed their teachers, he talked to some of their followers, and he came back and said, 
I find nothing wrong in it. People discover and become part of what they need. So those teachers who are practicing judgment, apparently, from what Swami Swahananda said, those people that are following them need to feel judged. They need to be criticized and, and spoken to in this way. <clears throat> uh, so uh, let us not find fault with others, as Holy Mother said, if you want peace of mind, my child, do not find fault with others. Do not look for the faults of others. Look to your own faults. And again, like, um, so Swami Vivekananda says, like, uh, we don't know ourselves completely, and who are we to judge anybody? Precisely. So, yeah. And, totally. and those, those who do come to know themselves completely become free of judgment. Exactly. <laughs> Anything else from anyone, dears? This is so priceless. One quick... Yeah, yeah. You had mentioned Scientology and Maharishi Mahesh Yogi today. I've been involved with both of those. I was a disciple of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and we had talked about the delusion, disillusionment uh, with your guru. I was at that point. However, you gave me an idea in that uh, the the TM itself, which Maharishi taught, the meditation was very good, and that was the first well, time yes. I'd ever read Bhagavad Gita. So, yeah, I, I think get some positive in Scientology too. I got some positive things out of I that. So, I don't, it wasn't I a total don't, waste. I really don't know personally anything about Scientology, but I certainly do know. I took the Maharishi's mantra in 1967, and it was, of course, it wasn't his mantra. It wasn't something he invented. It was one of the ancient bijas, which I came to know later. It is one of the most ancient of the bijas, the mantra that he gave me. And it, it, was, it worked wonders in my life and led me directly to Swami Prabhavananda and so on. I didn't see that directly at the time, but I see it clearly now. So yes. As I, and as I say, I don't know. And I'm glad to hear that you feel that you got something from Scientology. And is, is somebody else was going to speak at the same yeah, time. Just a quick clarification. That <laughs> quote uh, from John Wellwood, I'm not studying directly with Wellwood. Wellwood died a few years ago. I'm studying with somebody who gave me uh, the quote from Wellwood. I see. I misunderstood what you, what you sent me, Tom. I thought that this was a current teacher. Well, uh, may he have gone on to glory. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. You can read about him in Wikipedia. I'm sure, yes. Any, any, anything else from anyone? All right, dears. Let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. Let that infinite, universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace and beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Hari Om Tat Sat, O beloved Lord, make it so. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe, may we be healthy, may we be cheerful, may we have peace of mind, may we be always in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father.
Om Shanti 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 Peace, 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 peace and beneficence. Hari Om Tat Sat, beloved Lord, make it so. Any final thought from anyone? <clears throat> Thanks, y'all. Oh, thank you. Thank you, and thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you all. And then, uh, then our next uh, opportunity to gather will be Tuesday evening when we're studying the life and, as it happens, the passing away from this world of Sri Sharda Devi, uh, Holy Mother, that uh, uh, and it, it is very touching and very instructive to us what uh, how she left this world. That's what we're studying on Tuesday night. Uh, and then on Wednesday, of course, there's the, uh, the continuation of our reading and discussion of Swami Ranganathananda's book, Divine Grace. Uh, we're well along in the book. And just so you'll know, when we finish uh, the life of uh, Sri Sharda Devi, we'll take up the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna on Tuesday nights. Uh, and work our way through that it, it, as, it, as it happens, like with these great books, it'll take us at least a couple of years, maybe even longer, to get through the gospel. And then on Wednesday evenings, when we finish with Divine Grace and we're coming to the end of that short book, uh, we'll take up study of Bhagavad Gita on Wednesday evening. So that'll be probably uh, after the beginning of the new year. And again, may the blessings of these holy days be upon us all. The tanmatras, the, the energy that is generated by the amount of worship that goes on uh, in these final days of the year. It isn't just in the Christian tradition. Hanukkah is there, Kwanzaa is there. Uh, it is all of this devotional thinking. Certainly all of these uh, uh, holy days uh, have been uh, commercialized as well. Well, more power to those people who need the money. And uh, uh, we, we can pay attention to it or not, as is our choice. Uh, we can pay attention only to the spiritual aspects of these, this part of the season, or we can enjoy our shopping and giving to others. Um, is it, uh, brother, is, is, is it correct to say that uh, the Divine Mother's kind of worship or influence kind of grows as we start fall and pretty much goes all the way through spring a little more? The, 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 this stuff. is this this is the mother season. There is no two. Yes, okay. Holy Mother's birthday will be will be observed with a with a puja uh, in person uh, uh, on December eighteenth. Her actual birthday, as determined by the lunar calendar, and this year is December fifteenth. But the closest Sunday is December eighteenth, so we will have uh, her worship. But yes, the, the more we recollect these names and forms of the divine, the more we make them our own, the more the vibration of their presence, uh, the, the reality of them is felt in us. And it's intangible. Uh, it's as Ch Sri Chaitanya says, various are thy names. Oh Lord, and it could be it, 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 you know he was speaking about uh, uh, Sri Krishna, but it could be the Divine Mother as well. Various are Thy names, O Lord, in each and every name Thy power resides. So when we repeat those names, as he said, what happens? Chant the name of the Lord and his glory unceasingly, that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quenched that mighty forest fire, worldly lust raging furiously with. What stupid!
stupendous promises. If we chant the name so full of the power of the divine, it purifies us. It wipes our heart clean of its uh, tendency to distract us. And we see, if only briefly, clearly before the cloud returns over the sun. But this quenched, when he says quenched, that mighty forest fire, worldly lust. As Patanjali says in the Yoga Sutras, when we reach that point, those desires, that mighty forest fire goes dormant. Hmm? So <clears throat> thank you, Gaurav, as always. Anything even, else? Um, even Christmas oh. is on 25th, so I was thinking about that. So <laughs> Yes, and we'll have a we'll have a wonderful uh, Christmas Eve worship. I mean the Lord Jesus Christ is very dear to this heart. I was raised as a Methodist boy. And, uh, and furthermore, I spent time in the company of the Swamis who <clears throat> adored Christ, uh, Prabhupada, Swahananda, and those. And uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the heartfelt uh, worship of Christ on Christmas Eve is there. So well, well, I like to share. I I uh, studied Scientology for many years, and uh, matter of fact, I became an auditor, which was a teacher for Scientology. And uh, I have nothing negative to say about it, Scientology either. <laughs> well, that is, I Swami Swahananda spoke only the truth. This I believe with every fiber of my being. So I, um, I'm glad you echo that, Robert. Good. <clears throat> and then when I say echo, I don't mean you're <laughs> no, I simply I simply mean you are saying the same thing. I understand. Okay. Anything else from anyone, dears? Your topic is a great topic today, Brother Shankara. It will remind us not to rehearse the yeah. past and not to rehearse the future. Just live in this moment. That's all we have left. Yes. That's all we have. Yes. It's oh, and next week, wonderful topic. next week, for those of you who like a little entertainment with your, with your Sunday talks, we're going to discuss uh, Good King Wenceslas. The saintly karma, karma, karma yogi, the saintly karma yogi, good King Wenceslas. And 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 uh, brother, I, I I always feel every day I wake up, I think that that is a humongous joy to me. Yes. That that is one of the biggest. <clears throat> just just think about it. How positive is that? Waking up and seeing the seeing mother's beautiful world around you. Yes. The grace of being human, the first of the three graces. And there, there are so many people who can't wake up. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And then the second of the graces, which is manifested by this holy company here, the yearning to be free. Yes. The yearning, the mumukshatva, the yearning to be free. So the first and second graces are here. And then most of us who are here have found our way to some instruction, some qualified teacher. And uh, even those teachers who are disappointing, uh, though my teacher spends every night in the grog shop, still he is my teacher. Uh, a Zen koan. Uh, anything else from anyone, dears? Well, as always, so good to be with you, so good to share this holy company. Uh, and uh, any final thought? All right. Until next time, may we all be well and in bright spirit.